Hey everybody, today we're out here on the coast of Northern California taking a look at the all new sixth generation Subaru Outback. This is a very important vehicle for Subaru because this is the best selling Subaru period. 2020 is bringing us not just this all new Outback, but also an all new Subaru Legacy on which the Outback is based. Because whether you wanna call this a station wagon or an off-road wagon or an SUV, that's up to you, but this is very closely related to the Legacy sedan. Subaru doesn't deviate too much from their winning formula with the front end of the Outback, so this is still instantly recognizable as a Subaru. We have the Subaru logo right there in the middle with this strong bar across. Things have definitely been tightened up and made a little bit more modern, but again, still instantly recognizable as an Outback. We have standard LED headlamps on all models and LED fog lamps down there below on this particular model. If you get the top end trims, then the LED headlamps will steer in the corners. Subaru is a brand that has definitely devoted themselves to safety, both passive safety like the crash structures we find in the vehicle and active safety like the standard EyeSight safety system. That uses a stereo camera setup right here behind the windscreen to give us adaptive cruise control functionality with full stop and go, lane departure warning, lane centering, collision notification, autonomous braking, and pedestrian detection. In addition to the EyeSight system, we also have the standard Subaru telematic system for crash notification and vehicle monitoring, etc. But interestingly enough, two safety systems that are not standard on the Outback are the blind spot monitoring system with rear cross traffic detection and the rear autonomous braking. You'll get those in the upper end trims. The Outback has grown a little bit for this generation. It's now 191.3 inches long, making it on the long side of the comparative segment. That brings us along to what is the Outback? Some people want to call this a crossover, some want to call it an SUV, some want to call it a station wagon. What is it? I don't know if that really matters. What is it to you? Let me know down there in the comment section below. To me, this is a lifted off-road station wagon because forward from this area, it is identical to the all new 2020 Subaru Legacy. So the interior, the dashboard, the driver's seat, et cetera, the front doors, front quarter panels, et cetera, those are all the same as the four door sedan. Back here, we have a very traditional wagon profile, not the more upright profile that we see in something like a Subaru Forester or the Subaru Ascent. So this is quite different than something like a Santa Fe, a Murano, a Blazer, a Ford Edge, et cetera. But this definitely ends up in that category because of overall price, overall interior room, and then the overall size of the vehicle. This is about the same length overall as the Chevy Blazer. An interesting point of trivia is that the Outback is the only wagon variant in North America that outsells its sedan counterpart. Again, this is the best-selling Subaru on this continent. Compared to something like an Edge, a Passport, or even a Grand Cherokee, we have a more reclined seating position in this vehicle, and overall the body feels a little bit longer and a little bit closer to the ground. That puts the center of gravity a little bit lower than most of its direct competition and really helps improve handling in the Outback. A lot of folks love the Outback because it handles more like a sedan, less like a crossover, but has all of the advantages of a more rugged off-road vehicle. We have ground clearance in this model at 8.7 inches. That is definitely above the average for this particular segment. In fact, if you want more ground clearance than this, you're going to have to get something like a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and that's going to be an awful lot more expensive. Versus a compact crossover in America, like Subaru's second best-selling vehicle, the Subaru Forester, you might want to consider an upgrade into the Outback because you want the more premium interior finishings that we're going to see in a moment here, or you want a more powerful engine, like the available 2.4 liter turbo. Now, the model that we've been spending most of our time in today does not have that turbocharged engine because this is the one that most folks out there are gonna be driving, so this is the one that I wanted to get my hands on. Out back, we again have a design that is very familiar to Subaru shoppers out there. We have new tail lamps. These are combination elements, so they combine LEDs and incandescent bulbs as well. And then Subaru has tucked the exhaust up under the bumper down there to help improve the departure angles overall. Sorry for all the dust that's been on this model, Subaru really wanted to prove that this was very off-road capable. So we've spent about two and a half or three hours so far on off-road trails, and I still have about two hours of off-road trails to go before I can get back to a paved road. That's why this is as dirty as it is. Under the hood, which as you can see opens very, very wide, sort of like a snake unhinging its jaw, we find two different engines. First up, we have a two and a half liter boxer engine that's a new design shared with the Subaru Forester. That produces 182 horsepower and 176 pound-feet of torque. We then have an optional 2.4 liter turbo engine that's shared with the Subaru Ascent. That produces 260 horsepower and bumps things up to 277 pound-feet of torque. Both engines are mated to a standard continuously variable transmission, no manual transmissions available here, and standard all-wheel drive. The standard all-wheel drive system is important to remember when comparing the Outback or really any modern Subaru aside from the BRZ to the competition, because none of the competition, including the Grand Cherokee, come with all-wheel drive standard. 
As you'd expect, fuel economy is best with the base engine, getting us 29 miles per gallon combined again, even though we have that standard all-wheel drive system, and things drop down to 26 if you choose the 2.4 liter turbo. One of the design goals for the Subaru Outback was to give us the fuel economy that we find in a compact crossover and the overall capability that we find in a mid-sized two-row crossover. When it comes to front seat comfort, remember that the Outback is quite different than most of the competition. So some of this is going to be personal preference. Do you prefer the more reclined seating position that we have in this, the more car-like position where your legs are definitely out in front of you? Or are you looking for something that has a more upright, more minivan or more truck-like driving position, something that we would find in a Passport, a Grand Cherokee, something along those lines? Personally, I like a more car-like seating position, so I think this seat is more comfortable than the average in this segment. Unfortunately, it's not quite as adjustable as some. We just have a two-way adjustable lumbar support for the driver's seat and no adjustable lumbar for the passenger seat. That lack of adjustability on the right side of this vehicle is why I'm going to drop one point off of this car. We do have an extending thigh cushion for the driver, which is another nice touch, but we don't have that over there on the other side. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion and a two-position driver's seat memory over there on the door. This is the kind of vehicle where it's very easy for shorter or taller drivers to find a good driving position. A roomier back seat is definitely a reason you might want to look at the Outback over the average compact crossover, like a CRV or a RAV4. With this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, you can see I have about six or seven inches of legroom left. With 82.3 inches of combined legroom, this is one of the larger and more generous interiors in this segment, very similar to the Murano and the Santa Fe. That means that you're going to find more legroom back here than in something like the Honda Passport. We also find a little bit more width in this than something like a CRV or RAV4, so adults are going to be more comfortable in this back middle seat. And I have about an inch and a half of overall headroom, even though this middle seat is higher off the ground than the outboard seating positions. Moving all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, you'll really notice the overall legroom in here because the front seat is all the way back in its tracks and I still have about four inches of legroom left. The rear seats recline. We have a separate lever over here on the side of the seat that makes the recline mechanism function that's separate from the release latch for the 60-40 folding rear seat back design. The center seat position has a fold down center armrest right there, but it does not fold down independently of the other side. So this is a traditional 60-40 folding seat design. One thing worth mentioning while we're back here is that the center seat belt comes out of the ceiling, not out of the rear seat back itself like we do see in some of the competitive vehicles. Subaru has provided a loop on the seat back to help adjust the angle of the shoulder belt, but it is not going to be quite as practical as the seat belts that are integrated into the seat because it does take up some room back there in the cargo area. Behind this very dusty hatch, we find 37.1 cubic feet of storage space, or if you calculate it using the newer calculation method, 32.5. The key thing to know about the Outbook when you're comparing the spec sheet to the spec sheet on the competition is that Subaru is using a different calculation method for getting us the cargo capacity back here, and that gives us the smaller number of 32.5. So on their website, that's the number you're going to see. But Subaru told us that if you calculated it using the older method, which is what Honda, Jeep, Nissan, Kia, Hyundai, etc., they're all using that older method, then this would come in at 37.1. Any way you slice it, we have a pretty decent cargo area back here. Compared to most of the direct competition, the Outback's cargo area is a little bit deeper and a little bit squatter than most of them, just due to the overall shape and profile of the Outback. So that means that you'll be able to put different cargo in the vehicles. Longer cargo items right back here in this storage area, slightly taller items in something like a Honda Passport. I would rank overall practicality pretty similar between them, but again, differently sized objects in the different cargo areas. We still have a decent slope right here to this rear window, and that does cut down on cargo practicality a little bit. Under the cargo area load floor, we find some additional storage space, also a place where you can store the jack, tire, iron, etc. And then if we lift this foam divider up, we find a compact spare tire in this particular trim. Now, depending on the trim you get, you may find a full-size spare tire back here, and all Outback models could be equipped with full-size spare if you want to add one yourself later. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end touring trim. We've driven both the XT and the regular naturally aspirated version of the Outback, but both of them have been touring models. The available moonroof is a pretty standard sized unit. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and four-way adjustable ratchet style headrests. So we rotate that forward right like that. In this top end touring trim, the front seats are both heated and ventilated, and you can see that we have perforated sections right there to the leather. This is sort of a two-tone interior color scheme with the charcoal outside and the brown inside to the seat. Bolstering on the front seats isn't too aggressive, but you can see that we have bolsters on the seat back and seat bottom cushion. 
as you'd expect out of a vehicle that's positioned as a more premium alternative to something like a RAV4, a CRV, or a Forester, we definitely find interior materials that are a step above the average compact crossover in America. And that goes for the front and rear doors as well as the dashboard as we move right on over there. We have a brown stitch section right there in the middle, then a charcoal upper section to the dashboard. A small storage area where you could easily put things like a smartphone, whether it's connected to the vehicle or not, right there on the passenger side. Some more stitch trim. And then a moderately sized bin style glove compartment below. I'm not quite sure if you could fit some of the larger iPads in there. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, one of the things you'll notice immediately is we no longer have that separate small LCD screen on top for the trip computer and other readouts. Instead, in this particular trim, we find the facial recognition camera system right in here. This uses technology very similar to modern iPhones to recognize the driver and adapt certain vehicle settings like your seat position, etc. This will recognize up to five different drivers, and it can be used a little bit differently than the seat position memory seats on the driver's side door. But of course, the biggest news in this dashboard is this all new and all enormous infotainment screen. At just under 12 inches, this is one of the largest infotainment screens available in America. But perhaps more important than the overall size of the screen is the fact that this is going to be standard in every trim of the Outback except for the absolute base model. And that's a pretty big twist because when we take a look at something like the Ram 1500 or Ram heavy duty trucks where you can get the big screen, they're available only in the very top end trims. And even more interestingly than that, if you do get the base version of the Outback, you don't just get a tiny screen in the dashboard. For some reason, you get two 7-inch LCDs. The top one would do infotainment, the bottom one would do climate control and vehicle settings. Somewhat similar to the arrangement that we see in this large screen right here. If you want to know more about this LCD infotainment system, there's a complete video on just this. We're going to move on in this video. On either side of that large touchscreen, we find buttons for the temperature control up and down. You can also do that inside the software right there. Moving on down from there, we find an electric parking brake. Then if I move this shifter out of the way, we have a USB input for the infotainment system. There are two of them right there, and then a single auxiliary input, and then a storage pocket where you could easily keep a smartphone. Below that, we have a button for the front view camera. We have a front view and a back view, not a 360 degree view like we see in some vehicles out there. Pretty traditional console shifter. Drive is all the way back right there. Manual mode over to the left, and then you use the paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Behind the shifter, we find two large cup holders, a softly padded center armrest, and if we open this up, this reveals a two-tiered storage area, one area where you could keep smartphones or small knickknacks, a larger area down here where we have a 12-volt power port, and then the optional CD player. This is standard in the very top end trim and available as a dealer-installed accessory in the other trims. On the driver's side, we have an instrument cluster very similar to other Subaru models. We have a large tachometer on the left, a large speedometer on the right, and then a color multifunction display in the middle. The steering wheel is a round three-spoke design with sport grips up top and paddle shifters on the back. We have down on the left and up over there on the right. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system along with a voice command button and then dedicated phone buttons. These toggles down here toggle through the trip computer readout right there between the speedometer and tachometer. And then on the right side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the standard adaptive cruise control system. This button right over here turns on and off the automated steering assistant. And then we have a button down there at the bottom for the steering wheel heater. In case you're wondering, the buttons for the standard telematic system, they're right up here right next to the rear view mirror. When you get behind the wheel, you'll definitely notice how much more compliant the suspension is in the Outback than the average two-row crossover, something like a Chevy Blazer or the Honda Passport. The Honda Passport surprised me a little bit because Honda was really pushing that as the off-road capable Honda. And at the launch event for that particular model, I spent hours on an off-road trail and it definitely got tiring after the first 20 or 30 minutes. The Outback is very different. We've been on trails like this for simply hours today, and this is very comfortable, very livable in terms of the suspension tune. But the Outback is able to play two sides of the teeter-totter here because of its low center of gravity. Having a lower center of gravity helps improve on-road driving dynamics, so this is able to hold the road much better than a Grand Cherokee, even though we have a suspension that's just as softly sprung. The combination of car and SUV-like attributes are definitely what make the Outback an interesting option because we get an overall seating position that's more car-like. The view of the road, the way that you're sitting in the seat is very car-like, but we have the ground clearance that you'd expect in a high off-road vehicle. 
As I said at the beginning of the video, we've spent most of our time in this model right here, which has the base 2.5 liter engine. Zero to 60 in this model came in at 8.6 seconds, which puts this on the high end of the segment, very similar to what we see in the base engine in the Santa Fe, for instance. Remember that most of the competition in this segment either start out with a turbocharged engine or a V6 engine, but the Outback and the Santa Fe are the two that don't. We haven't had the opportunity to give this our official 0 to 60 or 60 to 0 testing, so be sure and stay tuned for that video when we can get our hands on this for a complete week. You should expect overall stopping distances to be fairly comparable to most of the entries in this category. Overall curb weight is fairly well controlled in the Outback, so I don't expect this to be on the long side. This should probably be right around the middle. In terms of overall dynamics, especially emergency braking and handling maneuvers, are definitely going to be more sorted in the Outback because of its lower center of gravity and the more car-like design overall. If the 2.5 liter engine isn't fast enough for you, there is of course the available 2.4 liter turbo, and that's the model that I'm driving now. Even though this looks identical to the model that I was driving a few seconds ago, this is in fact an entirely different vehicle that looks almost the same. On the outside, there isn't any visual differentiation other than the XT badge in the back, but once you hop in, you'll really notice the difference, because this goes 0 to 60 significantly faster. 5.7 seconds in our initial testing with this model. That's nearly three seconds faster than the base 2.5 liter model. Some of our fans over at facebook.com slash alexandautos were bemoaning the fact that Subaru has killed off the H6 engine in the Outback. To be perfectly honest, I don't miss it. The six cylinder engine wasn't the smoothest engine that Subaru ever built, and it was also pretty heavy. And that meant that we had a lot more weight in front of the front axle in that model. It really felt sort of like you had a boat anchor up there. This one definitely has improved driving dynamics versus that six cylinder boxer design, and we get much better performance. The turbocharged engine gives us an awful lot of low end torque, and that combined with this new CVT design means that we get significantly better acceleration and overall better handling because we have less curb weight up front. You'll really notice that when the road starts to wind here. We don't have terribly wide tires on this top end two ring version of the Outback, but we still have excellent handling. The suspension geeks in the crowd will be happy to hear that the Outback has a double wishbone front suspension, not a McPherson strut design like we find in most of the competition. Really, it's just this and the Jeep Grand Cherokee that use that double wishbone design. In general terms, suspensions with this sort of design give a better contact patch with the tire on the ground, and that's one of the reasons that Subaru can get away with slightly narrower tires versus some of the competition, and yet still give us better handling overall. Now on the downside, there have been occasions out here on the road where I've thought that the CVT software could use a little bit more polish. The way that this changes ratios and the way that the torque comes on and off with the turbocharged engine could be integrated just a little bit more smoothly. But overall, this is certainly the most fun that you can have in the Outback. So if you're thinking the Outback is a little bit too slow, this is definitely the option that you're going to want. Talking about fuel economy is a little bit difficult because obviously we haven't been driving this on the same test course that we drive every other vehicle out there. But in general terms, Subaru's vehicles have been pretty efficient, and I don't expect anything different out of this generation of the Outback. So the EPA numbers of 29 miles per gallon combined for the 2.5 liter engine, 26 miles per gallon combined for the turbocharged engine are pretty likely. I suspect that if you treated this turbocharged engine very gently, you'll likely get over 26 miles per gallon. Overall, out on the road, this Subaru is still unmistakably an Outback. If you've liked that about previous generations of the Outback, you're going to love this. This is definitely a refinement of that same idea. But if you didn't like the Outback before, this is probably not going to change your mind. Although I prefer to call the Outback a wagon, this could also be seen as one of the truest crossovers in America. Because this has the off-road ability that you'd expect in an SUV or a crossover, but it has the on-road driving dynamics of a sedan or a station wagon. And that, in my mind, really is what a crossover is supposed to be. And now to the nitty gritty. Pricing for 2020 starts at $26,645. That's a pretty small bump over 2019. We get standard eyesight, standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, 18 inch alloy wheels, LED headlamps, and the dual LCD infotainment system in the dashboard, which is again different than the model that we've been driving today. That's about a $4,000 jump over the Subaru Legacy. That does seem like a pretty big bump in order to get the Outback over the related sedan. However, $26,645 is notably less than most of the two row competition that you might want to directly compare with the Outback. This is significantly less expensive than the Edge, than the Passport, definitely less expensive than a Jeep Grand Cherokee. But it's not too far off what we see in the Hyundai Santa Fe. Until you take into account the fact that we do get standard all wheel drive in this model. And again, that is one thing to keep in mind when comparing this to the competition, both in terms of overall price tag 
and in terms of fuel economy. You may get slightly higher fuel economy in some of the front wheel drive alternatives, but you won't really get better fuel economy if you're comparing this to some of the all wheel drive options out there. Most people are probably going to be interested in the premium trim. That starts at $28,895 and gets you the 11.6 inch infotainment system that we saw in this model. We also get key features like two zone climate control, unpowered driver's seat. The premium package allows you to add options as well. So for $1,400, we can add the blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic detection, keyless entry and keyless go, which do not come standard on this model. And then the power tailgate as well. Subaru also allows you to add more premium options to that particular trim like navigation and an optional moonroof that we don't generally see in lower end trim packages in this segment. So you could get a very nicely equipped premium trim of the Outback for about the same price as a base model Passport. Now the Passport, like the Murano, the Grand Cherokee, the Blazer, etc., they come standard with a V6 engine. And if you want more power under the hood of your Outback, then you'll have to step up to at least the Onyx trim to get the 2.4 liter turbo that's under this model right here. That will set you back at least $34,895. Subaru is positioning the Onyx XT trim as the more youthful trim. So we have blacked out trim all the way around. We get the dual X mode set up on the inside, very similar to what we see in the Subaru Forester, and of course the 2.4 liter turbocharged engine. Then the limited and touring trims come next in the lineup, and those are available with either the 2.5 liter engine or the 2.4 liter turbo. We've driven both of those versions today in the top end touring trim. The top end XT touring model will set you back $39,695. As usual, for our full comparison section, you'll have to wait until I can get my hands on the Outback for a complete week. But let's run through some of the options right here. I have some notes to help me out. The Hyundai Santa Fe all wheel drive with the naturally aspirated engine will start at $27,450. It will definitely be more expensive than the all wheel drive version of the base Outback. We then have the Honda Passport, $33,890 starting for the all wheel drive model. Ford Edge, $31,990, a little bit less expensive. You could probably also compare this to a Nissan Murano. That starts at just over $32,000. And if you want a Jeep Grand Cherokee, which also is an interesting competitor to this, again, $32,195, but that would only get you a rear wheel drive V6 Grand Cherokee. So it's easy to see that the Outback is a very, very good deal in this segment, just as we've come to expect from Subaru. You can say the same thing about almost every Subaru out there in the base trim. But a lot of Subarus out there end up falling apart a little bit when it comes to the very top end trim. So for instance, if we take a look at the Subaru Forester, the very top end trim of that one compared to some of the very top end trims of the competition, we don't find all the same feature content in that Forester. But the Outback is a little bit different because the Outback here with its 2.4 liter turbocharged engine is one of the fastest entries in this segment. In our initial zero to 60 testing out here in Northern California, this was below six seconds zero to 60. That puts this significantly faster than something like the Honda Passport, even with Honda's new nine speed automatic transmission. It also means that this is significantly faster than the Nissan Murano, the Hyundai Santa Fe with the two liter turbo and almost as quick, oddly enough, as a Ford Edge ST, but this is gonna cost an awful lot less. We also have Subaru's latest interior design in here, which definitely has the ability to compete with the best in this segment. Now it's not quite as snazzy as some of the top end trims of the Jeep Grand Cherokee, but again, it is significantly less expensive than those top end trims that are gonna be nicer than this. And perhaps most importantly, the interior is definitely ahead of what we see in the Honda Passport. The Passport's interior dates back to 2016 because Honda just lifted the Honda Pilot's interior and put it in the competitor to the Outback. This, they didn't do that. They gave it a completely new interior with that enormous infotainment system in the dashboard. In many ways, I think the toughest competitor to the Outback, and again, we will go into this in more detail when we get our hands on this for a full week, is the all new Hyundai Santa Fe. It has an excellent value proposition as well, although again, this is less expensive in base form, and you can get some of the same premium features in the top end trim. But in that Santa Fe, it will never be as fast as this turbocharged Outback, and it's never gonna have that enormous infotainment system screen. You can thank the low center of gravity in the Outback for that handling ability and the more car-like driving nature of this as well. This is also gonna be a little bit more fuel efficient than that Santa Fe as well. So bottom line, if you're shopping for a more premium two row crossover in America, you should definitely be putting the Subaru Outback on your shopping list. And it's no wonder that the Outback is one of the best selling crossovers in America. In this more premium two row segment, only the Grand Cherokee outsells the Outback. 
And I think that that has more to do with the fact that there's so many different varieties of Grand Cherokee. There's a 5.7 liter V8, a 6.4 liter V8, a 6.2 liter supercharged V8. There's also some uh, very, very off-road capable Grand Cherokees. But the bulk of the Grand Cherokee lineup is a direct competitor to this. And I suspect if you exclude all those other models, the Outback might be beating the Grand Cherokee in terms of overall sales for a very, very good reason. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And if you were shopping in this segment between about 27 and $40,000, what would your top pick be? If you haven't found us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, be sure and do that now. And if you want to support us, click up there to the top of your screen. You'll be taken on over to patreon.com. I'll see you next week.